honor the reading of God's holy word. 1 John 4, 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You may be seated. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning asking, Lord, as we just heard this passage read to us, O Lord, that you would open our eyes, Lord, that we may see and understand more clearly, Lord, because of your word this morning, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, and the spirit of error. Lord, help us to to grow as Christians in being aware of the things and the messages that are given all around us. Lord, we ask that you would take your word, that you would bless it to us this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, earlier in the service, we we heard a little bit of a harsh passage read from Ezekiel. Now, there were were some glimmerings of good news and comfort there that God was going to restore his people, that he was going to take the heart of stone out of them and and give them a heart of flesh, that he was going to put his spirit in them. That is certainly good news. But it was tough to hear God say through the prophet Ezekiel that when he restores them, he's going to remind them of their sin, to remind them that it's not because of them that he's saving them, but for his own glory. It was also hard to hear it is because of you, O Israel, that my name is profaned among the nations. And anyone who knows their Old Testament, who's read through it, knows why God is saying that. You know, over and over and over again, how often did Israel fall prey to idolatry and false teaching in their history? There was a lack of discernment. I I think of what the prophet Hosea said in the Old Testament. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. God's word was not being taught faithfully in Old Testament Israel. And it had drastic and devastating consequences. Fast forward to New Testament times, the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the, the reality of spiritual gifts in the church now that the Spirit has come. And he mentions gifts of all kinds, gifts of knowledge, you know, gifts of service. But one of those that he mentions is gifts of discernment, the gift of discernment. Or he says, distinguishing of spirits. Now, when you read passages like that, it's so easy to, again, fall prey to the temptation that, that, you know what, that's a spiritual gift that some have and others don't. Some people are discerning and others aren't. Now, while that may be true from one degree to another, this passage actually offers a needed correction, a needed balance to what Paul is saying, I shouldn't say correction to what Paul is saying, but a needed balance to what Paul is saying in saying that all Christians in every age are called to be discerning. In fact, that's the idea of this passage in 1 John chapter 4 this morning. Christians are called to test the spirits by their confession concerning Jesus Christ and by their response to the proclamation of the gospel from Christians. That's the main idea. 
It breaks down into two points, doesn't it? Let me repeat that. Christians are called to test the spirits by their confession concerning Jesus Christ and by their response to the proclamation of the gospel. So I want to begin unpacking our first point here, testing by confession in verses 1 through 3. And we see in verse 1, very clearly, the call to test the spirits. Take a look at verse 1 again. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, it's interesting the way he phrases that and the way he begins. Beloved, do not believe, he says, every spirit. Now that's fascinating because if you go to the very uh, verse right before that, in chapter 3, verse 23, which we saw last week, what does he say? Or actually, verse 24, excuse me. Um, No, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. It's fascinating to me that he ends, he ends our, our passage last week with the command to believe. Believe on what? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he flips it and says, don't believe every spirit. The fact that he commands belief in one instance and, and don't believe in another instance shows the need for discernment. And so because of that, he says, he follows it up with, test the spirits. Test the spirits. Well, that word test in the original Greek is a word that's used in in other literature outside of the Bible to talk about testing metals for, for suitability for using in coinage. Now when you think about, you just think about in the ancient world when they or even today, when they make coins, you want to have the right kind of metal. In the ancient world, they they used primarily gold, silver, and bronze or or copper. But you have to ore, you have to mine that out of the ground and and pull it out. And, And as they're smelting it, as they're purifying it, and as they're trying to get all the dross out, there is a certain standard by which those, that metal had to, to pass muster if it was going to be used suitably for coins that were going to carry value in the Roman Empire. There was a process involved of testing the metal. And that's the idea here when he says, test the spirits. Just like the metal had to be free of, of, of dross and other pollutants before it was suitable to be used and accepted as valuable, so the same is true of teaching that comes from different spirits. And don't miss that. The fact that he ties spirits to teaching here. The question we have to ask as we think about testing the spirits is, does it, we have to test the content, obviously, of what is being presented to us, what is being claimed. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, does it measure up with the standard of Scripture, which is unchanging, which is fixed, which is objective? Or does it fall short? Does it contain dross and pollutants? I would also argue that Part of the testing that John has in mind here is to measure the fruit of the teaching. What kind of fruit does the teaching produce for those who are listening to it and then implementing it and applying it in their lives? Why does he give this this commandment, test the spirits? Well, we see at the end of verse 1, why? For many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's interesting. False prophets give a a message, don't they? And what you see is he's connecting the message of prophets, whether true or false, with a spirit behind that message. There is a spiritual quality to teaching of all kinds. And we're not trained to think that way here in in the, the West in the 21st century, but that is the reality that John is opening our eyes to. Everything that we hear... Everything that we take in, 
There is a spiritual quality to it. And the fact that many false prophets have gone out into the world is not a message or a warning that was unique to John. In fact, I don't know if you really given, have given any thought to this, but there, of all the 27 New Testament books, every single one of them warns of and deals with false teaching except for one book, to my knowledge, and that's the book of Philemon. Every other book in the New Testament deals with false teaching. Jesus warned about false teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20, he talks about beware of false prophets who come in among you as wolves in sheep's clothing. And he says in that passage, you know, you will know them by their fruits. He warns in the uh, Olivet Discourse uh, in Matthew 24, verse 11 and then verse 24, he talks about false prophets and antichrists or false Christs going out into the world after he leaves the world, after he's crucified, buried, and resurrected. He talks about in Matthew 24, 24, that when they come, they will seek to deceive or lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Paul warns about the problem of false teaching repeatedly in his epistles. You read almost every, every one of them. There's something in there. 2 Peter chapter 2 warns about false teachers, drawing specific attention to the fruit that they bear, calling many of them greedy, calling many of them immoral, calling many of them sexual, um, sexually immoral and idolaters. Jude chapter, uh, Jude chapter, it's one chapter. Jude verse 3 exhorts Christians to attend, uh, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints against false teachers. And interestingly enough, this, is, this lends a little bit of context into why John is saying this. If you were to look at 2 John, just, just turn a page over in your Bible, or 3 John, 2 John chapter 7 verse 11 and 3 John uh, 5 through 8 warn about false teachers that would go from city to city and often from house to house. And that was a common thing in the ancient world. You, you see the example of that when, when the Apostle Paul and those with him would go from city to city. They would go to the synagogues first. And if you remember in, in Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas go to the synagogue, the, the synagogue ruler turns and says to them, Brothers, if you have a word of encouragement or exhortation or instruction, stand up and speak. It was common for people to be received from city to city and given the opportunity in that cultural milieu to, to speak or give a teaching. And so John, in that cultural milieu, is warning when these people come, test the spirits. You don't know who they are. Test the spirits. Now, how does, how does he tell them to do this? We see in verses 2 through 3 the method of testing the spirits. Let's take a look at verse 2 first because they kind of are contrasting one another. In verse 2 he says, By this, this is the method, that you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Let's stop there really quick. Take a look at that. Look at the substance of the confession. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now let's, let's pick that apart for just a moment here. The fact that he says Jesus Christ has come in the flesh implies that if he's come, he's come from somewhere. And the question is, where is he coming from? Jesus gets at this over and over again in his dialogue and debate with the Jewish religious leaders in the temple in John chapter 8. He keeps telling them, you know, you guys don't even know where I come from or where I am going. I've come from my Father, and I will be going back to my Father. And that, of course, caused some confusion, and they're asking, well, who is your Father? Clearly what John is getting across here in our passage is he's come from the Father in eternity past. From eternity, the Son of God has existed. Like his Father, never having a beginning, will never have an end, fully divine, 
He's come, and he's come in the flesh, meaning the incarnation. We've heard this before in John chapter 1, verse 14. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. One person, fully or truly God, and truly man. It's a mystery. It's the incarnation. But it's because of the incarnation that Jesus of Nazareth lived a perfect human life under the law. It's because of the incarnation that he truly died on that cross for the sins of his people. And it is because of the incarnation that he truly, literally, bodily, and historically rose from the dead on the third day. If you deny the incarnation, you cannot affirm any of those things that are central to the message of the gospel. And so John is saying, look, it is important. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Those who confess Jesus coming in the flesh or having come in the flesh are from God. And the centrality of that confession is the fact that John has reiterated this over and over and over again in this short letter already. In the beginning of this letter, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-4, through 4, he highlights this. That which we have seen, that which we have beheld, that which we have heard, that which we have handled with our hands concerning the word of life. And then back in John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. You see, John is, what John is after here is communicating to us that it is important that we get the object of our faith correct if we are going to have saving faith. That's what he's getting across. But look at, look at the other side of this test in verse 3. You see the denial here. There's a confession. There's also a denial. He says, in every spirit, verse 3, that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. What's the substance of that denial? Doesn't confess Jesus. Now, he doesn't say it word for word the way he said it in verse 2, but it's, it's shorthand. He's making the same point. Anyone, anyone who does not confess Jesus Christ having come in the flesh, in other words, the incarnation is not from Jesus. God. Notice the scope of this denial. He says it's the spirit of the Antichrist. What you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. Now, it's interesting that, again, in that context, in the first century, think about the two main groups of people that were in churches at that time, Jews and Gentiles, right? The Jewish teaching of that day and I would argue Jewish teaching now, denies that Jesus was the Messiah. They also deny, because of that, that he's the Son of God coming in the flesh. You talk to any religious Jew today, they will deny that. But at that time, the, among the Gentiles, there was what was called a group of Gnostics, they were teaching in the first two centuries, they, they were teaching from a philosophical, uh, you know, Platonic worldview. And they denied the possibility that the divine Son of God could truly become flesh and blood in the incarnation. Notice, there's no discrimination here in terms of salvation, but there's also no discrimination of false teaching. Whether Jewish or Gentile, John says here, it's of the same spirit of the Antichrist. And he repeats what he had said earlier in, in, John, in 1 John chapter 2. The spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now already in the world. And so we have to take a step back and, and ask ourselves, well, how do we apply this today? What does this have to do with us today? Well, the, the application point here is that we can discern the spirit of the Antichrist active today by first not being gullible as Christians, 
and by thinking critically about the truth claims made to us and measuring them by the standard of Scripture. That's, that's the application principle. And so this is, brothers and sisters, a call for discernment. It's a call that we not be gullible. That we not be gullible. Now, why do I, why do I highlight that? Well, because in, in the West today, we, we have a context where we, we value freedom of speech. And we talk about this more in, in, uh, in political terms, and I, I understand that. But it has implications for the fact that when you have a society that is at least built on the idea of the freedom of speech and the marketplace of ideas, that means that some people will say really smart things. And some people will say really stupid things. And we are told that we have to put up with all of it. Now, in one sense, that's true. You don't want to just go and, and someone says something that's you know, off or, or stupid. You don't want to just call them stupid. That's not Christ-like, right? But we make the jump in our thinking to them believing that, well, we have to just accept what everybody says as equally valid. Do you see the, the, the leap there? <laughs> and yet, we're called to be discerning. We've come to a place in our society, I think, where we let all kinds of people say what they want in terms of spiritual teaching. And we oftentimes let those people go unchallenged because we don't want to offend anybody. And when we... When we do often say something and take a stand for someone and try to carefully tell them that they're wrong, we hear the also common reply today, who are you to say that so-and-so is wrong? Brothers and sisters, again, when we think of testing the spirits, when we think of testing these ideas, we do not test these things on our own authority. We don't, my feelings, my thoughts, my experience, all these things, that's not the standard for testing these ideas. What is the standard? The standard is this. The standard is this. It's not me. When I stand on the Word of God and apostolic teaching found in Scripture, I am on the solid ground that I need to base my discernment on. That I base my discernment on. You know, we live in, again, in a day and age where everything is acceptable to the postmodern man and woman. This is a call for bold discernment and, dare I say, ruthless discrimination against ideas that raise themselves against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is sadly not only what the world is missing these days, but oftentimes what is missing in our churches. And it is, it is tragic. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5, through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh and blood, but have the, the divine power to destroy strongholds. What does he mean by that? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to urge you and exhort you to boldness, and I want to exhort you to not be gullible, but be discerning. Be discerning. And we do, we do rely on the Holy Spirit for that discernment. Now, I want to, want to just kind of shift and give some examples of, of how we see the spirit of the Antichrist in our own day. Now, one of the things I want to do with this part of the application is going to be a little more teaching oriented. And the reason why is when you talk about discernment, you're talking about seeing truth from error. And so what I want to do is just walk through a few examples with you, lay out the pattern that I think John uh, lays out here in this passage and apply it for you and kind of model what that looks like so that when you go into the world, you at least have some kind of template in your mind of what this could look like as you analyze things that, that you're hearing every day. Okay? 
Now, so the pattern that I want to lay out for you, and this is one of the things we see the Antichrist do, and we see it in the, Old, in the New Testament, we see it today. Here's the pattern, and it doesn't always happen in this order, okay? First, false teachers will often get you to doubt or outright deny the authority of Scripture. Okay? That's the first thing, at least as I'm putting this together. They get you to deny or doubt the authority or truthfulness of Scripture. Think about Satan and how he worked in the garden, right? What did he say to the woman? Did God really say? His tactics have not changed. Doubt. Secondly, what does the spirit of Antichrist do? Once doubt is created, they will substitute what the Bible says with their own authoritative teaching. Think about that. You're basically just exchanging one authority for another. But there's always an authority. And then thirdly, when they've created buy-in for their own substitutional authority, their teaching leads to outright denial that the eternal Son of God became man in the incarnation. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. That's how he works. And he does this over and over and over again in history. Let me demonstrate that for you. I'll give you a few examples. These are the same examples I used uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about the spirit of the Antichrist. Um, but I'm going to look at it a little differently. Think of Islam. The religion of Islam, I mentioned that a few weeks ago. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ, and therefore they deny the incarnation of Christ. Believe it or not, I don't know if you knew this, they actually deny that Jesus even died on the cross. And so while they claim to be that Jesus was a true prophet of God, and they do even call him a Messiah, they empty him of every essential aspect of what the Bible reveals Jesus to be as the Messiah. So how did they come to believe this false teaching? Well, think about the pattern I just told you. Many of you may know, many of you may not know, that how, how Muhammad claimed to receive his revelation to begin with. Did you know that he claimed that the angel Gabriel um, appeared to him in a cave outside of Medina one night when he was meditating by himself? And if you actually go back and you read the Hadith literature in Sahih al-Bukhari, it narrates the, the, the whole thing for you. The angel came up to him, grabbed him, squeezed him. It actually comes across as very abusive and demanded that he repeat and recite what he's telling him. That is the foundational revelation of the Quran. Isn't it interesting that Muslims will tell you today that Muhammad was an illiterate man? That's one of the reasons they say the Quran is such a miracle. How can an illiterate man produce a holy book? But here's what's interesting. Because he was illiterate, he did not know the scriptures that came before him. And so if you were actually to read the Quran, what you will find is the Quran actually is it's the substitute revelation. Remember I said that's one thing that the Antichrist does. Well, it turns around and it appeals to the Bible, but the things that it says about the Bible, if you actually know your Bible, it contradicts the Bible, which creates doubt. And so you'll hear many Muslims today, if you actually engage them in conversation, if they're religious enough and know what they, and paying attention in their, their, um, their mosques, they will tell you, well, we don't believe the Bible because it's corrupted. You see how the spirit of Antichrist has worked? Create doubt in the Bible. Create a substitute revelation. And what does that substitute revelation do? Denies that Jesus is the Son of God. Denies that as the Son of God who existed in eternity, He came in the flesh and became a full human being. And thereby denying the gospel. Islam is not the same, or is not the only... Religion has done this. Think of Mormonism. It's the same pattern. Joseph Smith claimed to have a revelation of an angel who revealed to him what became known as the Book of Mormon. You read the Book of Mormon, it, it, it doesn't line up with what the Bible says. 
And so if you talk to a Mormon and you appeal to the Bible, what will they often say? Well, we believe the Bible, but it has to be interpreted correctly. What are they doing? Creating doubt as to the authority of the Bible and how you're appealing to it. What do they do then? They substitute it with the Book of Mormon. Have you ever read what the Book of Mormon says? You read the Book of Mormon, what does it do? It presents a different Jesus. It presents a Jesus who is the product of, of God the Father, who himself was a man, who was then glorified and became a God, who lives on another planet, who came down and physically impregnated Mary, who, and produced Jesus, whose brother happens to also be Satan. That's a different Jesus. <laughs> it's the same pattern, the same method, the same strategy, but of the same spirit of the Antichrist. I'll give you two more for the sake of time. Jehovah's Witnesses. You ever get them? Knock on your door? I'm not going to lie, guys. I love when Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons come to my door. I just, oh. I'm not saying this to brag on myself. I brag on the Lord, but I, I just, I love when they come over. Because usually most people can't get them to leave their house. They, they can't wait to leave my house. <laughs> they always get in their car and just take off. They're done after me. Um, but I love it because the mission field is coming to my door. You know, sometimes that's a, a rebuke from the Lord that maybe I'm not being as evangelistic as I need to be. But Jehovah's Witnesses are a little more subtle in the approach, but it's the same pattern. Have you ever had them come to your door and, and they're, they jump into their little diatribe and they're reading passages from their Bible and you realize, wait a minute, your Bible sounds different than mine. They've created their own translation of the Bible, which is not really a translation, it's just a Bible that was then modified to fit their doctrinal positions. Then they create doubt in you about, well, why does your Bible say that? Mine says this. It's the same thing. They create a doubt of the Bible, and then they, they give you their own authoritative revelation in their own Bible. And, and if you listen to what they're saying about who Jesus is, they don't believe that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. They believe he's a creature, the first creature that God ever made, but a creature nonetheless who then God turned around and used him to create everything else. And then if you listen to him long enough, they'll tell you he's the Archangel Michael not the same Jesus. They deny the incarnation. Same thing John's warning us here. One last one. Secular humanism or, or naturalism or, or just a secular worldview. That's more overt and obvious. A secular worldview didn't, certainly denies the authority of the Bible. By definition, because they believe that only this world is all that there is and all that is important, they fundamentally, in principle, deny that there's a God out there who could reveal himself in the scriptures of the Bible, and then that's authoritative. They deny that, and so what do they replace it with? Well, they replace it with all kinds of things. They replace it with science. They replace it with logic, reason, experience, or, or dare I say today, our own feelings. Those are the barometers of truth. Those are the authorities that are appealed to. And because there's really no God out there who can literally enter into this world and reveal himself and become, you know, flesh, they deny the incarnation and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you see the pattern, guys? <laughs> Do you, it's, it's the same spirit who's, who's doing the same thing. But it just looks different. And yet all these people around us that fall prey to this, who have precious souls, are duped. And John is telling us, watch out. I mean, I realize that's a quick run through of the method of how the Antichrist works through history. But in modeling this, I'm hoping that... that you know, in applying what John is saying here by testing the spirits, I want to model this so to exhort you to think through the messaging that you encounter on a daily basis. You encounter messages through the media. You encounter messages through social media. You encounter messages through your education if you're still a student. Or your reading, your entertainment. 
and the list can go on and on. The exhortation is, Christian, be wise, be discerning. The spirit of the Antichrist is active today. And that leads us to our second point in verses 4 through 6. Testing by response. It's not just testing by what, what people confess, it's testing by response. Look at, look at verse 4. You see the basis of, this, of testing this response. In verse 4, John writes, Little children, you are from God. You have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What I want you to see there is that the, the Holy Spirit is the basis of this test. John says that the Spirit who dwells in us is greater than the Spirit who is in the world. Now, I've mentioned before that John key keeps returning to the same themes over and over and over again and looking at them from different angles in this letter. He's doing it again right here. We already saw the Spirit talked about in 1 John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. If you were to go back and you were to look at that, this is what he says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Same context, same theme, different angle. Verse 27, but the anointing or the spirit that you've received from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. It's the Spirit he's saying here in verse 4 that teaches us, which counteracts the false teaching that comes from false teachers. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And so the antithesis of the spirit that dwells in us is the spirit that is in the world. In fact, if you were to see, if you were to go back a few pages and look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Apostle Peter says this, Be sober-minded. Why? Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It always astounds me when you watch these, these horror movies from Hollywood about Satan and how, you know, demonic things. And it's always these weird, you know, horrible things that happen. But, you know, Satan's greatest activity in the world that Peter is warning to, to watch out from when the devil's going around like a roaring lion is the same thing John is warning about. It's subtle, it's seductive, it's attractive, and it's false teaching. <laughs> That's how Satan is mostly active in the world today. But I love the, the encouragement, um, as John says here in verse 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have overcome them. Who's them? False teachers. How have you overcome false teachers? He's saying because you've been discerning what he you just called us to. And 1 John 5, 4 says this, who is, who is it that overcomes the world or the spirit of the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? How is it that being discerning and having faith overcomes false teachers because then you are not led astray and you persevere in the truth and in faith in Christ. You're not like a, a victim being carried off by a roaring lion who's about to devour you. So what's the method here? Verses 5 and 6. And again, there's a contrast, just like in verses three, uh, 2 and 3. Look at verse 5, the spirit of error. It says very clearly, They are from the world, being false teachers, Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. That's not hard to understand the logic that John is using there. 
What he's essentially saying about these false teachers, they are of the world. They are born of the world. They think like the world. They speak from a worldly perspective, and the world listens to them because they speak the language of the world. Have you ever been in a conversation with an unbeliever about something and you're just thinking to yourself, man, we're not even on the same, we're not even playing the same ball game here. Like, we're not even on the same field. We're speaking different languages. There's a reason for that. And he's getting at it right there. The te- false teachers speak from a worldly perspective. The world listens to them. Well, what's the other side of that coin? Verse 6, the spirit of truth. Look what he says. We, so there's a contrast, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let me just clarify one thing. When he says those who listen to us, the us in that context is the apostles. Those who are giving us the scriptures. So when I say those who listen to us, you know, look, someone might not listen to Aaron Lira if Aaron Lira is giving his own personal opinion, and that's fine. That does not mean that they are from the spirit of error. But those who don't listen to the scriptures, those who don't listen to the authoritative word of God, and that listen is not just letting it go in one ear and then out the other at worst, Or at best, going in one ear and then agreeing and then that's it. Listening has to do with, yes, agreeing, confessing, but also your actions, your response, your behavior to what you have just heard. This is why James says in James chapter 1, I think it's verse 22, do not be just hearers of the word, be doers of the word. There is, there, there is no um, separation, biblically speaking, from belief and behavior. And that's what John is getting at. That's what the second test is all about. What fruit does, does teaching produce? False teaching is going to produce bad fruit. Good teaching is going to produce good fruit. And that's what John is after here. That's what John is after here. Those who listen to us, those whose lives are transformed by faith are from the spirit of truth. So again, what's, what's our response to this? Well, the faithful and obedient response to God's word is the evidence that we have overcome the world. That's the idea. There's a call in here to persevere in the Christian faith. When verse 4 says that believers have overcome false teachers, he states that as a fact. And that fact contains an implicit exhortation for you and I to persevere in the Christian faith. Look, there is a rampant anti-intellectualism that runs through much of American Christianity. Right? We are called to not just leave it here. And we're called that when we come to faith, it's not just that you come to faith and, okay, now I'm on autopilot. I'm a Christian. I can do whatever I want now. No, that's not what he's saying here. We can't just put ourselves on autopilot, our hearts, our minds, our lives, and expect to to land in the, the airport of heaven somehow. No. We must continue to be vigilant for the attacks of the enemy. We must, brothers and sisters, grow, continue to grow in grace, continue to grow in our understanding of God's Word so that we are equipped to discern truth from error. We're called to continue to live out the truth and have our lives transformed so that the world around us does see that there's something different about us because you will know them by their fruits. Let me read what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 20. You will recognize them, and he's talking about false teachers there, false prophets, by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Now, I, I want to just say, while he's talking about false teachers there, those who succumb to false teaching and embrace it then bear the same bad fruit. And that's, that's the warning. That's the danger for every one of us. And so as you, as you think about this, as you think about what this means by way of application for your life, what this passage calls us to do, brothers and sisters, is to examine the fruit of our own lives. You might find an example of bad fruit in your life. Whether that fruit is, is, is an action or an attitude, you might find it. And I would encourage you to prayerfully trace that action or that attitude back to discern what is it that you are falsely believing that fuels that fruit. I'll give you one example in conclusion. In my quiet time yesterday, I was reading in Amos chapter 6 and 7. And particularly in Amos chapter 6, um, God through his prophet rebukes Israel because what they're doing is they assume that judgment is far in the future. And because they think judgment and accounting is far in the future, they have time now to do what they want. And so what did they do? They pursued their sin. They did not deal with their sin. They didn't repent from it. Have you met people like that? Maybe you've had that attitude. Well, I, I, I still have 30 good years left before I have to give an account for the Lord. So live it up today, right? Why, why worry about it? No. False teaching bears false fruit. So Christians, we're called to test the Spirit's by their confession concerning Jesus, and we're called to test by their response to the proclamation of the gospel. Are they bearing good fruit? Are they bearing bad fruit? And by believing, are you bearing good fruit? And are you or are you bearing bad fruit? That's what God's word calls us to wrestle with this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of Scripture. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit who dwells in us and is greater than he who is in the world. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would make all of us discerning by your word and by your spirit this morning as we go forward from here. Lord, we are bombarded with so many things in this world and in this society it's not just our own flesh. It's all kinds of things from the outside just hitting us constantly. Father, help us to be discerning. Protect us, O oh Lord. Keep us in the faith that we might persevere until the end. And so, Lord, we pray for the strength to do this today and this week. We ask in Jesus' precious and holy and righteous name. Amen.